Thank you, Glenn. I really appreciate this opportunity. Um, the disclaimer is that um, this is only the second time I've shared my story um, in recent years, and the first time was for about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, I'm a little bit anxious, but um, I'm, I'm grateful to know that I'm in a, in a safe place um, where I can just share from my heart. And my, my hope is that um, not that I sound really good or that, um, you know, I make really grand and wonderful statements during this time, but really that it might resonate with somebody and touch somebody else's heart um, and, and make, make a difference um, in some way or other. So I'll, um, I'll probably be pausing a lot and, like I said, just a little anxious and nervous, but I think the best place for me to start is just to share with you about um, how I got my start in this world. I grew up in a pretty... Um, pretty amazing home with uh, two parents, and um, I was the oldest of two kids. My sister was almost eight years younger than me, so I was basically an only child for a long time. Long time. Um, but I remember at a pretty early age feeling, I don't know if it was anxiety or more just um, awkwardness or out of place, and um, I think that, you, you know, growing up and and having other kids around, um, trying to fit in and do those things that would, would help me feel a little less anxious and a little better about myself. I grew up in a neighborhood that was uh, kind of a brand new neighborhood. And so the families that moved in there were all um, similar. The parents were similar in age to my mom and dad. And there were, were just a ton of kids. There was a, a bunch of us. And it was really a cool way to grow up, I think, because we had so much freedom. There was no fear. I think today, you know, about kids growing up, and, and I just realized how very special that childhood was to be able to run around outside with everybody um not having all the technology and everything, we just spent every day outside that we possibly could. Um, when we started school, we would spend days at school and then spend every moment we could outside. Um, even if it was cold or raining, we just we just congregated. And um, so for me, that was really pretty cool. What what I do remember very much is that my dad was a very hard person. He was very stoic. He was very, um, the, the emotion I saw the most from him was, him was anger. Either he was aloof or he was angry. And my mom, um, she was a pretty caring and loving human being and still is today. Both my parents are still living. I grew up kind of between two worlds though, because in the summertime, from the time school was out until school started again, a lot of my days were spent on the farm where uh, my ma maternal grandparents lived. And they raised tobacco and cows, and it was, it was a lot of hard work. So even though I kind of grew up in this lower middle class family, I grew up with a really a strong work ethic that was ingrained in me um, from a really early age. And um, my, my maternal grandparents were very, very loving. But <clears throat> my maternal grandmother, she was a wildcat. She was something else. Um, I love her to this day so dearly and have such good memories. But um, just kind of to talk about who she was because it shaped who I am. She was a very strong person. She ruled with an iron fist. She loved hard. But um, when we were priming tobacco and doing all the things on the farm, you know, her motto was that children are to be seen and not heard. Um, and she she meant it. She I can remember many a times getting hit upside the head with one of those tobacco sticks because I wasn't paying attention or, or listening or doing what she told me to do. 
But in the same hand, she was also very loving. And I think that shaped my mom into who she was. And it had a very big impact on who I became and, and my values. Um, that side of my family was very strong spiritually, um, a Judeo-Christian faith, um, Baptist, Southern Baptist, the whole nine yards. So I grew up learning a lot about hard work and, and ethics. Um, I, I grew up in the church and in, you know, from a very young age, just to remember having a sense of God and a a sense of purpose and um, a desire, I think, to know more about that. So the first time I was introduced to any type of mood-altering chemical, and I think back about this, um, I was probably seven or eight years old, and I began having um, this really bizarre pains in my stomach that people didn't know what to do with, doctors didn't know what to do with. And so my mom um, talked to the doctor, and he sent her to the drugstore to get paragoric, which is opium, really. I mean, it's it's pretty intense medication. And so when I look back, I think, you know, that was probably the moment that addiction was triggered in my body. I don't remember craving it or anything like that. Um But what I do remember is just a few years later, I started experimenting very rarely, but with alcohol. And then um, I think I was about 14 years old and some of the older neighborhood girls, I started hanging out with them and they were smoking pot. And one night they decided we were going to camp out in our backyard. And so we had these tents in the backyard And they commenced smoking marijuana in mass quantities to the point that I I couldn't see anymore. I was having really weird experiences. I went and lay down in my tent and prayed to God that I would be normal when I woke up the next day. And fortunately, I was normal the next day. But but, um, I did get caught and... um, you know, swore I would never do anything like that again. And I was a really good kid in in high school. Um, you know, other than that one experience and, you know, kind of sneaking in my parents' liquor cabinet from time to time, um, I really didn't drink much. I didn't do many drugs. I didn't get into trouble. Um, I loved learning, and I really loved getting the stars that you got for doing a good job in school and getting A's and and having that kind of recognition. And part of that, again, is probably goes back to the fact that I felt very self-conscious most of the time. I was a really tall, skinny girl in school. And the boys did not like really tall, skinny girls. First of all, I was taller than most of the boys, and I was really skinny, which means, you know, that I didn't have all the shapes and curves that um, guys were looking at. And so... Again, it was just this compensation trying to find something I was good at so that I could be approved of by my peers. Um, I did have this really wonderful boyfriend in high school, even though he broke up with me every time I turned around. He was very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Respectful. Respectful. And, um, you know, I, I just... Loved being around him and hanging out and those kinds of things. But it wasn't until, I mean, this is how good a kid I was in high school. Um, I was kind of tough, though, but I never skipped school. My senior year in high school, we were going to have a party at somebody's house, and I finally skipped school, but only for a half a day. Like, I wrote a fake note so I could be out of school for the last part of the day. I just I just wasn't good at being the bad kid um so anyway you know during that time at the very very end of high school I think I started experimenting a little bit with drugs and alcohol well not drugs but more more drinking a little bit and then I met this guy and he um he had newly found Jesus 
and I met him and I thought he was the coolest thing since sliced bread. My boyfriend had broken up with me yet again, like for the hundredth time. And so I started dating this guy and four months later we were married. Um, so I met him in April, my senior year, and by August we were married. And well, there's something about the, the history of people who have addiction in their in their beings that they're drawn to other people with addiction. That's just the bottom line. I, I believe that firmly. Um, and you'll find out more why I believe that because of my life story. But he was a drug addict and an alcoholic who found Jesus and quit, you know, cold turkey. The problem is he was also very physically abusive and emotionally abusive. And um, so after about 11 months, um, I left. And um, but I left and, you know, because I already had some other guy that I was going to be seeing, too, you know. I was very addicted to people and um, by that point in my life was addicted to men I, because that's where I found my um, value and my worth. I wanted to be loved, but I was willing to just accept sex or whatever, I, you know, men were willing to give me. Um, so I left that that marriage and just went from relationship to relationship. Um, some bad, some good, but most did not last very long at all. And that's when my drinking and my drug use really, really took off. Um, I was, I, I was just trying to find something to fill a void, and I couldn't find it in relationships with men. I couldn't find it um, in the drugs or the alcohol, but I sure did look hard, and I sure did try. Um, <clears throat> I ended up in a in a relationship with another uh, man who also was an alcoholic <clears throat> and married that person after several years of dating. And within 10 months, I had left him and was in another relationship. Um, I mean, I never really got out of a relationship until I already had another one lined up. So it was just back-to-back, -back, you know, relationships, and really um, on a downhill spiral. Um, and right towards the end of that second marriage is when I got introduced to a drug <clears throat> that had the potential to really destroy me, and, and it really tried. Um, I, I can honestly say that I became a person that I never thought I would be. I, um, if you know, go back to my childhood and the way I was brought up, um, very strong faith, very hard working morals, you know, you're always honest, et cetera, et cetera. Um, to the bottom, really, really did. And um, <clears throat> I was in a relationship with somebody we ended up um, doing drugs all the time. I don't know how I managed to keep a job. But also during all this period of time, here I end up going back to school. I had been in nursing school right after high school, dropped out after a year um, when I separated from my first husband. And, you know, I went to work as a secretary because that's what people did. If you, you know, dropped out of college, um, women became secretaries. So that's what I did. But for some reason, I ended up back in college and pursuing a degree in psychology. I don't know how I pulled that off. I worked full time Monday through Friday, five days a week, and I went to school full time at night. So I worked until five. I went to school every night until nine and partied my ass off. I mean, I partied and partied like crazy. And there were times that I would be up for days at a time and I would call out of work 
Um, sometimes I'd skip school to be able to party. I didn't, I didn't have a clue how I managed to, to pull that off. But um, towards the end of that debacle, um, I really got sick and tired of that lifestyle and, and dealing drugs to support my habits. Um, I, I was just tired of it. I was just sick of it. And it was only by the grace of God that I was able to walk away. That and my, I owed my dealer way too much money and couldn't get any more of my drug of choice. So um, uh, then here I go into graduate school. Well, the the man that I was dating for all of this period of time, um, I didn't want to be without. Now, remember, I could not be alone. I had to have a man. I had to be in a relationship. And But I had already sworn off. I tried twice the, this marriage thing, and it didn't work out for me. So I swore I was never getting married again. Um, I applied to a, a very nice college, Wake Forest University, and got accepted there and got a full scholarship and got a job working as a hall director of a residence hall full of um, freshmen women, 200 freshmen women. The problem was that they didn't agree with cohabitation. And so I could have the job and I could go to school there, but my boyfriend could not live with me, and I didn't know how to do that. So we got married, marriage number three, and I was probably 25, 26 years old by then, not very old. And when I went to graduate school, I went to graduate school to be a counselor because I was going to teach people how not to do that one drug that got me in trouble. The rest were okay, but that one, you know, I was going to be a substance use counselor. And when I started doing my internship, I was introduced to AA and to 12 steps because I started my internship in the treatment program. And I was just floored by what I learned and what I heard. I decided that I needed to have AA in my life, that I needed to get sober. This uh, aha moment of the reason that I have all these problems in my life and the reason that I struggled so much is because I was an alcoholic and a drug addict. And if until I until I dealt with that and reconciled that in my life, nothing else was going to be good. Nothing. So I started going to AA. And um, I got a sponsor. I went to, to meetings twice a week. And life was really good. But also during that time, um, that last year, um, when we were living in a residence hall full of 200 women, my husband at the time then was drinking pretty heavily. And um, he got a DUI. Not to tell his story, but he did. He got a DUI and wiped out several cars on campus. And so I, I work for, you know, the the school. And my husband has had a DUI, and somehow that did not end up costing me my job. Um, but it was kind of an eye opener for him as well. So eventually, we both started going to AA and got into treatment. And not into treatment, but but started working a program. Um, and I did that for quite some time. And and then I graduated from from um, college. I had a baby the same year that I graduated from with my master's degree. And and then on top of all of that, there was this this group of ladies who studied the Bible. And my mom and my aunt were really important in my life. And um, they started, you know, asking me to go to this, this group where these ladies are. And I did. And 
that was probably when, for me, I developed this relationship with the God of my understanding that really made sense to me and really gave me a sense of peace that I had never had before. It was what I was looking for. It was exactly what I needed and had been longing for all those years that I was in relationships, being rejected or feeling rejected in using drugs and alcohol. It filled that big hole inside of me in a way that um, I just can't even begin to describe. So for the next 26 years, I stayed sober. Um, I had this relationship. I got very, very involved in um, church work and community work um, and service. And after a few years, decided that I didn't have time for AA. And I... um, I became a a mom of three boys eventually. God bless me. Yes. And um and I I did a lot of community work, um a lot of work in the church. And then I worked part-time um in different different treatment facilities and I was just a busy lady. I was really really busy. And at some point, I decided that wasn't enough, so I'm going to homeschool these three boys. So I did. Three different grades. Um, I love to tell the story about my youngest who had um, has ADHD. And, you know, I had each of them in separate rooms, and I would go from room to room, you know, checking on everybody, making sure everybody's paying attention, we're doing our work, and blah, blah, blah. And the youngest one um, would be, you know, I'd sit him in the chair in his room and watching this video and then helping him with schoolwork, and I'd go check on others, and I'd come back, and he'd be laying on the couch. And I'd say, get up and sit in the chair, put him in the chair, and I'd leave, and I'd go back, and he'd be laying under the table, and then I put him back in the chair and then I'd go back and, and come back and he'd have his chair sitting on top of the table. And and that to me, that's just such a picture of kind of what I tried to do with my own life. You know, I just try to do everything. I just tried to make sure that I could do it all. I, and And I was probably successful at that in a lot of ways. But so often there I didn't work on me you know so gradually that needy kind of angry person started to fester again and you know it never it never to me was that bad but um but it it I just didn't work on me I just didn't take care of cleaning my house the way I needed to Um, As a counselor, you know, I'm supposed to know how to handle everything. And um, one of my kids was really, he just really struggled emotionally with a lot of stuff. And I couldn't fix that. Um, My husband, who I'm still married to, thank God, today, um, we never, we just didn't see eye to eye on a lot of things. And Rather than focusing on me, I was always trying to fix him. Eventually, you know, I was just an unhappy person again. I mean, I had a sense of peace and I had my faith that never, ever, ever left. But there there were just problems. And then when when you're a person who, like I am, and I put all of my faith and all of my hope in being able to raise these kids, that was the most important thing, to love the God the way I knew God. And gradually, one by one, as they grew up, they they got they developed minds of their own. What the world, you know, I I didn't want them to have minds of their own. I wanted them to have my mind. And they became very 
wonderful human beings, but each one of them kind of walked away and did their own thing. And I got so depressed. I mean, severely, severely depressed. And then the job that I had at the time was very stressful. There were some people that were backbiting and carrying on. And I remember many days driving to work in my car. And I would I would say, if I can just hit this bridge, it'll all be over with. And I won't have to worry anymore. You know, I even said at some point, I just wish I would get some sort of serious illness and just die. And I won't have to feel this hurt and this pain that was just really consuming. It was really awful. Um, and I had several years before that um, finally gotten on the antidepressant, but it just, it, my, my stuff just overwhelmed any medication I could ever take. And then my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer. It was November of 2015. And she was diagnosed with breast cancer. And we went through some stuff. Um, now, mind you, my her mom had died of breast cancer. So I remember asking the doctor, do we need to be thinking about genetic stuff? And the doctor's like, no, 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 don't worry about that. Well, that was November. She started doing her treatment um, in January. And lo and behold, in February, I was diagnosed with breast cancer, too. Um. I went through, in 2016, four different surgeries. And uh, in addition to walking with my mom through all of her different things, and I decided that, screw this. You know, um, I, I still have my faith. I was holding on to my faith, but I thought, if ever anybody deserved a drink, it's me and it's now. And maybe since I was clean and sober for 26 years, well, let's say clean. I don't know about how sober because I, I equate sobriety with being emotionally healthy and I don't think I was. You know, maybe I was just young and stupid and didn't know how to drink. You know, maybe it was just that one drug or those other drugs that got me into trouble. Um, because I never got a DUI or any of that stuff. So I decided I'm going to start drinking. And we live up here in the wine country, and everybody was turning their tobacco fields into vineyards. And so we had wineries everywhere. And some people in the church, um, they went and drank wine sometimes. So apparently it's okay with God if we drink wine. So I started, my husband and I, I talked him into it too. He, now, he hadn't had anything to drink or drug in all this time either. And so we started going to wineries. <clears throat> and, you know, at first it was every couple of weekends we'd go to a winery and we'd drink a little bit and that would be it. Um, and then over the next five years, my drinking just increased a little more and a little more and a little more. And it started being every weekend and it'd be Friday and oh, well, not really Friday, but Saturday. And then also Sunday afternoon. And then we buy, you know, a case of wine and bring it home. And so then I'd have wine here at home and I would start drinking you know, having a glass or two during the week um, every now and then. By the time I got to, after five years, I was drinking almost every night. And I, being in the profession that I'm in, I would sit in meetings with doctors and so forth and so on. And I remember one day this doctor who it was an inpatient doctor treating folks with substance use and mental health. And she was talking to all of us around this conference room table. And she said, you know, we don't talk enough about people that, you know, um, what, what does really constitute problem drinking? And she said, 
you know, the in order for you to not be an alcoholic, and I can't remember how she phrased it, but that was the gist of it. You know, women are only supposed to drink zero to one drinks a day. And men, you know, one to two drinks a day. And no more than seven in a whole week or something like that. Well, I thought, holy cow, I drink a whole lot more than that. You know, I drink. I remember I remember when I realized how much a glass of wine really was. It wasn't fill it to the top. You know, it was that little part you're supposed to put in the bottom of the glass. Um, <clears throat> and I began to realize how much I was really drinking because I wasn't drinking by the glass. I was drinking by the bottle at that point. And, you know, saying to me, you're only supposed to drink seven glasses of wine in a week. I'm like, I do that in one day. So I'm going to try to control my drinking. So I tried that for a little while. Didn't work. Didn't work for me at all. And um, there were times that I would black out and not remember things. And that was the frightening part for me. I don't remember that ever happening before. And um, I was I would be embarrassed that maybe I said or did something that I couldn't remember. Now, granted, by this point, we would go to the winery and drink a few drinks, but then bring it home. And so most of my drinking was at home. Um, but every now and then, you know, I'd go to my sister's pool or something. And I remember, you know, not remembering how I got home from there one day and and so that blacking out just really scared me. Um, and the more that happened, the, the more I questioned whether I was an alcoholic. And there's that statement in that says, um, in our opening statements, we read, if you think you have a problem with alcohol, you're welcome to attend this meeting. And what I started to hear in that when I first came back to AA was, if you think you have a problem with alcohol, for me, by the time I asked that question, I did have a problem with alcohol. Um, but the last drink, the last, last drunk that I had, I was, I couldn't get high enough anymore on wine. So I was drinking alcohol mixed, I mean, like liquor mixed with wine. And I was starting to compare the alcohol content and get the most, you know, potent wine I could find or the most potent liquor I could find so that I could get high. And um, I drank and drank and drank one night. And the next, it was a Friday night. And the next day, um, we were supposed to keep my grandson. And I was so sick that I had to lay back down. Tim, Tim went in, my husband went and got um, our grandson and brought him home. And I couldn't be awake. I couldn't function. I had to go lay back down for a few more hours. And that was when I said, I'm done. I, I am done. This is enough. I want to be here for my grandchild. I want to be the, the kind of yaya that he needs. And so um, it was happened to be during COVID also. I called a friend of mine that I used to go to the wineries with who had been sober at one point before she and I started going to wineries again. I said, where can I go to an A meeting? And she told me, but then I found online AA and I started going to AA meetings and I realized I'm an alcoholic of the hopeless variety and I really, really want to be sober. And I was such a mess and people were so good to me. They were so kind. Um, they would say good morning to me. On these meetings, I remember being in some meetings in the afternoon on the way home and ladies from that group reaching out to me and taking me into another group room. And um, I, I tried multiple times to connect with people in face-to-face -face groups, but there was something off about that. And then I found this group called Sober Start that met in the morning and I could be a part of that group every day on the way to work. I, it was kind of a way to start my day. And um, I had never stopped having my time with God in the morning, but now I would have 
my time with God in the morning, get ready to go to work, and then have my time with my sober family. And then I got a sponsor. And then I relapsed. I uh, I had such a strong craving to drink. Oh, it was terrible. And um, they, they sell wine at the um, Dollar General, folks. And the Dollar Generals are everywhere. You can get it on the way home. And my car just pulled in there and got a bottle of wine. And I drank the whole thing that night. So my sponsor the next day, and she said, well, you know, you got to tell it. So I did in the group. I said, I'm back on day one, folks. And I did good for about two months. And then that same craving got a hold, and I relapsed the second time. And that was August the 19th. And I talked to my sponsor again. And I was just tired of screwing up all the time. And I said, this is it. I got serious about the program of AA. I started working with my sponsor. I started attending a big book meeting with Glenn. Um, and I started reading the big book. And I started, I rem- I'll never forget Glenn, you know, he had these he had these things on his fingers, you know. You don't drink, you go to meetings, you work the steps, you get a sponsor, and you read your book. Well, I always kept forgetting read your book for some reason, but I started doing that too. And I started going to meetings every single day. And I started talking to my sponsor and I started working the steps and I I got a lot of stuff off my chest and out of my heart that really had been just keeping me down for years and years. And um you know, I realized there's just a lot of things that I kept inside. And and I realized that even in 26 years of sobriety, being sober, um, not drinking, that I still um, never really dealt with me. So I started dealing with me and working with me and letting God do for me what I couldn't do for myself and changing me what I couldn't change in myself. Um, I also have sponsor, um, the first sponsor that I had, um, I just, I didn't feel like, like that. It, there was quite a connection, wonderful, wonderful human being with lots of sobriety, love her still to this day, but I needed somebody that was really going to help me be accountable to doing this work because I'd already not done the work, you know, before. For 20 some years. And what I began to realize was God does for me what I can't do for myself, but there's a part that's my responsibility. And the only way that I can stay sober is to stay connected to AA because it's only through AA that I can remember I'm an alcoholic. And what that really means for me is. I can never, ever, ever drink again. And I will forget that if I don't, if I don't do what I need to do. If I don't go to meetings, call my sponsor, don't drink, work the steps and read the book. I'm liable to forget that I'm an alcoholic. Being an alcoholic, however, has been one of the best things for me these last few years because it gets me out of myself. At the same time, it makes me look at myself and stop trying to focus on what's wrong with everybody else. I do that with my family, not so much my friends, but my family. And it's given me the courage even to ask my kids what does my best me look like and what does my worst me look like? And to be able to hear from them, these are the things that we see in you, mom, when you're doing really good. And these are, this is the kind of person, this is the kind of mother and person that you are when you're sober and you're working on yourself and your, your best self. But this is what you look like 
when you're not. And that's kind of hard. Um, it's, it's hard to think about that I'm not perfect and all that um, and all wonderful and that um, to realize that I've made mistakes. But um, today I can sit with that. Today I can sit with the knowledge that I have made mistakes, but um, I'm working to, to not make those same mistakes again. I'm working really hard to be a bit better version of myself and to, um, to take this message to other alcoholics. Um, I'm, I've got a sponsee, um, and I... The person that I asked when I first started back to AA, the one that I used to go to um, the wineries with, about uh, a month or so after I started going to meetings, no, a, a month or so after my last relapse, she called me and she said, tell me, tell me what you're doing. And she's. Um, one month shy of my anniversary, so she'll celebrate next month's two years. And um, it's just kind of come full circle for me. I don't know if that's made any sense to anybody or if it's helped anybody, but I talked for a long time, much longer than I thought I would. So um, I'm I'm done. I'm talked out. <laughs> Thank you so much, Glenn, for giving me the opportunity to speak today. I was really scared to do it, but I'm grateful. Um, to AA and to you and all these sweet faces on this screen.